What's up, everybody? This is your boy Uber Hikari, aka the Nerd Nigga, here to bring you another video with no frills, just the analysis. And today I'm here to bring you the season three, episode four review of The Walking Dead entitled Killer Within. Before I even say anything, spoiler warning. <laughs> Major spoiler warning. I really, I usually don't put these at the beginning of my episode reviews because it's kind of assumed that you've already watched the episode before you watch my review. But just in case you don't, because of this episode had just so many profound events in it and so many important events in it. If you haven't watched the episode, you don't want to watch this review. Just going to tell you that. Now that I've got that <laughs> out of the way, my response to this episode, wow. That's how I would sum it up. Just, just wow. An absolutely amazing episode of The Walking Dead. And I must say this, it is, it has now solidified its spot with the first four episodes of this season the Walking Dead has now solidified its spot as one of the best shows on TV. That's not debatable. That's that's there's no there can be no doubt about that. There can be no arguments about that. I generally consider Breaking Bad to be the gold standard of writing on TV at least in in the modern modern era or at least recently right now. Uh, that's that's the gold standard for me. And although I still don't think The Walking Bad is quite at Breaking Bad's level, it's pretty damn close. This episode proved that it is pretty damn close. And um, I must say that when I was watching this episode, I felt so bad for Lori. I mean, if you don't feel bad for Lori, you don't have a heart. I mean, I, I, I was, I was, I mean, my eyes started misting up. I was moved to tears when I saw that scene of Lori dying. Because no matter how much you hate Lori or dislike Lori or thinks that she's, you know, made it to bitch status, nobody deserves to die like that. I mean... Lori never did anything to deserve to die in that fashion. And to see Carl have to kill his mother, or at least shoot her corpse so that she wouldn't return as a walker, and to see Maggie literally have to drag the baby out of Lori's dead body. I mean, that was... And it's, it's rare that I'm, I'm, I'm touched by a TV show that much. I think the last time I was this moved was the 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 series finale of 24. I mean this was just wow. That, I mean again that's this that's all I can really say. And also kudos to one of my uh subscribers. I don't know if he's a subscriber actually one of my commenters who pointed out that that the person who we saw in the sneak preview last week was probably Andrew and when he wrote that comment I went back to check and in fact it was the same shoes <laughs> that Andrew had on so kudos to you for catching that and also one other thing who was looking at Carol I mean she's dead now but I still would like to know who who was looking at her a couple of episodes ago because we now know that it couldn't have been Merle because when Andrea and Merle were talking in this episode Merle made it seem as if he hadn't been in contact with the group since they left him on the roof of the, that building so I mean unless he's lying about that and I don't see why he would lie about that and I don't really see how he could have ever been at the prison really it seems like Merle is now disqualified for being uh, a possible you know, person who saw Carol. And, yeah, because he hasn't, he's, he's told Andrew he hadn't seen his brother in, you know, since the last time he was on that roof. So I don't think that that was the person watching Carol. So, um, 
I'm now very, very curious about precisely who it was who was watching Carol a couple of episodes ago. All right, so this episode starts off, now to get into the summary and analysis, uh, this episode starts off with somebody who we now know is Andrew in a prison uniform lurking around the prison in the prison yard, and he's using meat or you know pieces of meat from presumably dead bodies and also... Uh, it looks like a, some kind of animal. I don't know exactly what kind of animal it was. But he's using the meat to lure the walkers um, into the prison. And you can see he also has an axe and he breaks the, the chain, keeping the gates to the front of the prison closed to keep the walkers out. He takes the axe and breaks the chain. And presumably he's going to let the walkers into the prison. And that's basically the setup for this episode. Uh, after this, we see that the group is starting, Rick's group is starting to uh, try to go through the beginning stages of, of building a community or something that looks just tentatively like a society. And so they're starting to plan out how they want to plant their crops and how they want to farm. They, they want to clear the prison of all the, the dead walkers and the dead bodies and so, and they want to burn them in one shot so they can get rid of them. And so they're going through those beginning stages. And we see that the two prisoners who were left on the other side of the prison, they come to Rick's group and they're like, uh, listen, we want to join your group because we can't live like this in our side of the prison. And really, who can blame them? I mean, they're living inside of a prison with dead bodies, um, infected dead walkers, their food is going to run out at some point in time. And, you know, who? so who can blame them? And Rick is basically like, this is non-negotiable. When we, when we came to an agreement, the agreement was we stay on our side of the prison, you stay on your side of the prison. But, the, but they basically keep pleading with Rick and the group saying that their conditions are just absolutely unlivable. They, they can't get rid of the bodies because every time they walk outside and try to burn them, the other walkers show up. And so, you know, they basically, they, they can't live in that situation. So Rick, T. Dog, and Daryl, and I think some other members of the group, they get together, they have a conference. And basically the only one who's willing to allow them to join the group is T. Dog. And Daryl basically says no. And Rick basically also says, you know, no, we can't trust these people. They're strangers to us. We don't know them. And we'll have to sleep with one eye open. And I'm not willing to take that risk. And so he goes back to the prisoners and he basically tells them, listen, you either abide by the initial agreement and stay in your side of the prison or we're going to have to kick you out. And I thought this was this was very interesting because it reminded me of Herschel when Herschel wanted to kick uh, Rick's group off the farm. Initially, he didn't want them to stay there and he was going to turn them out in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. And I had this whole thing about where I was basically calling Herschel a fake Christian because of that. And now look at the position Rick was in in this episode. Again, man, the evidence for Rick's similarity to Shane is mounting and you <laughs> I know people don't want to acknowledge this or admit it but it's true because at the end of the episode we find out that those group of prisoners were you know basically responsible for saving Rick's life and they turned out to be good people and he was on the cusp of turning them out in the middle of a zombie apocalypse and condemning them to death I mean so that so the evidence for you know, Rick's character transformation and the way in which he's becoming more similar to Shane is that evidence is mounting episode by episode. So just wanted to point that out to you guys. Um, and meanwhile, while this is this is going on, uh, Michonne is, I wouldn't say she's desperately trying to get it, get away from the governor, but her spidey senses, <laughs> if anybody knows what that means for Spider-Man, but her spidey senses are, are basically tingling. She's suspicious of the governor, and her suspicions are growing. She basically finds a little bit of evidence, um, which leads her to believe that the story that the governor told her about the military often officers are, in fact, not true. She inspects one of the vehicles that... 
the governor brings back from that military outpost and she finds bullet holes in it and she also finds blood. And I think one of the remarks she said was, hmm, I wonder when biters learned how to use guns or something to that effect. And so the governor is trying to manipulate her by deflecting attention away from himself. And he basically says to her, well, you know, the, the walkers got to them and maybe if you had been there, it wouldn't have gone down like that. And so we get to see that the, the governor is, is a, a, a rather manipulative fella. And so basically we get the sense that the governor knows that Michonne knows what he's done. So we get a little cat and mouse type of thing going on here. And Andrea, but Andrea, on the other hand, it looks like she's starting to warm up to the governor. She, she's falling for his... Um, manipulative tactics and at first I thought she was just being stupid because it, it and and one of the things that that really irked me was that not only did she appear to, to be stupid because Michonne's instincts have been shown to be right several times in the past at least it was implied that was implied to be the case so not only was she acting stupid by all of a sudden mistrusting Michonne now but I thought that this might have been somewhat of a character inconsistency for Andrea, considering the fact that she never seemed to be that type of person to be taken in by somebody's you know manipulative tactics. But then I started to think about it, and I thought, yeah, it's kind of easy to see why she would want to engage in this sort of self-delusion, because Woodbury, after all, looks like a nice place, and it looks like it could be a symbol of hope, and it looks like they're starting to, to build a society and maintain some semblance of civilization. So it's not difficult to understand why Andrea would be susceptible to this type of manipulation um, from the governor. But it's, but it's clear that the governor is manipulating her. At one point, they're, they're sitting at, at a table and they're talking and the governor's trying to convince her to stay. And he starts talking about the people who have died and how his, his, his family also died. And, and it looks like he's trying to use some, sort, some form of empathy to gain her trust. And it pretty much pays off because at the end of the episode, we see that Andrea, in fact, decides not to leave with Michonne after all. And in terms of the governor's characterization, his characterization is somewhat interesting because it's not at all clear precisely what his motivations are. And here's what I mean by this. On one hand, it looks like he could just be a sociopath. That he could just, you know, really not give a crap about other people around him. And I remarked in my last episode review that the way he collected those those walker heads in the tank are eerily reminiscent of the way serial killers like to collect trophies. And so that's that's one reason why I thought that he could just be a sort of sociopathic character. But on the other hand, I remember a conversation that he had with Andrea and Michonne in the last episode where he seemed to be um, almost have this, this sort of pathological obsession with wanting to recreate civilization and society. So it could be just the case that he's not sociopathic, but that he just has a warped um, commitment to some conception of civilization. And in order to maintain that commitment to civilization, he'll justify just about any, any action in order to achieve that, that sort of warped goal. So I'm, I'm really not too sure about his motiv motivations. And as a result, his characterization at this point isn't that clear to me. But I will say that I, I really like this aspect of the show because it, it gives the show an extra dimension. It's almost like we're getting some political intrigue and mystery along with the horror. And I, I really like that about this show because it's expanding its, its boundaries in terms of its genre classification because we see that, that it's a horror in the sense that it's a lot of blood and guts and gore, but it's also a horror from a psychological standpoint because of the characterization of the governor. 
Um, so I really like the way they're, they're sort of expanding the boundaries and the scope of what the show is, that it's not just a horror, but that it can also have aspects of political intrigue as well as a little bit of mystery thrown in as well. So I, 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 th I, I really like that, the, the way the writers are kind of pulling this off. But in any event, um, we get back to Rick's group and we see that basically all hell has broken loose at the prison. Um, the walkers basically invade the prison. And the symbolism here was, was very, very strong. Um, we, there's a scene where Herschel, um, after his leg has, you know, been amputated, mild way to put it, <laughs> um, but he's tired of being inside of his prison cell. He doesn't want to be lay, laying there anymore. He wants to get up on his feet and walk around and, and, you know, survey his surroundings. And so they, they get him some crutches and he's walking around the prison and he finally walks out into the prison yard. And there's this, this very, very nice scene where, Everything seems to be going well, and Herschel's walking around, and everybody's laughing, and they, they've got a smile on their face, and just when things start are starting to look up, there's a shot, a sort of panoramic shot that allows you to see behind Herschel, and we see a group of walkers making a beeline directly for Herschel. They're, they're right inside the prison yard, and they're, you know basically about to start a rampage. And this is what I meant when I was talking about the symbolism of the prison in the first episode. The earth is a prison and everybody who's left on earth that's not a walker is basically a caged animal. That's what these people are. They will, it looks like they're never going to be able to rest. They're, they're never going to be able to recreate civilization the way that most of us think that they need in order for their condition to be livable. I mean, just when things are starting to look up, walkers invade the prison. And what's interesting about The Walking Dead is that there are two types of horror here. One is the horror of the zombie apocalypse. That's obvious. But another type of horror is a psychological horror. It's the horror of human nature. Because in, in this situation, Andrew was the one who let those, those walkers back into the prison. And the governor was the one who, who, in the midst of a zombie apocalypse, when people should be banding together to create some semblance of civilization, it was the governor who killed those people at the military outpost. So we've got two types of horror working in tandem. And I really, really like the way the, the writers are bringing those two aspects of the show together to, to highlight just how effed up this situation is. Um, so once people see the walkers, they, they start panicking. They have to shoot the walkers. And at some point, they realize that somebody is sabotaging every, everything. They realize that somebody had to let the walkers into the prison because they see that the chain on the front gate has been cut or broken. And also, the sirens of the prison come on, and everybody knows that sound attracts the walkers. So... Everything is just, at this point, total mayhem. And they have to kill the walkers, and they have to get back to the prison, to the generators, to turn off the sirens to stop more walkers from being attracted to the prison. And T-Dog. Oh, gotta talk about T-Dog. I feel so sorry for this guy. I mean, seriously. T-Dog gets bit. And it's not like he gets bit on the arm or the leg. I mean, it's clear that the writers want to kill this guy off because he gets bit like on his shoulder. And God damn, if I haven't mentioned this before, but those walkers are strong as hell, man. I mean, they took a freaking big ass chunk out of his shoulder, man. And it's really kind of lame. Because I'm tired of this cliche of the black man or the black person always freaking dying. And in, in, in any type of horror show or horror flick, it's it's really lame and it's getting on about my last damn nerve. But at least I could say that T-Dog went out like a hero, sort of, <laughs> you know, sort of, um, because he sacrificed himself in order to save Carol so that she could get away 
and attempt to turn off the sirens, but in the end, she died anyway. So, I mean, but I guess T-Dog kind of felt like, well, I've already been bitten on the shoulder. There's no hope for me. Uh, I might as well go out like a freaking boss. So he just basically said, F it. And at the end, we see Rick, Daryl, and I believe Glenn, um, they, they find his dead body and it's basically the walkers eating his carcass. So that's how T-Dog went out. And also, the other major aspect of this episode, while this, well, while all of this is going on, Lori goes into labor. And I was very, very surprised to see this uh, because I was not expecting her to have the baby this soon. I mean, we knew this was going to be a major component of this season, but it's only four episodes into a 16-episode season. So I was really surprised to see this come to fruition so quickly. So Lori goes into labor and she starts having complications with the labor. And I know a lot of people were speculating about the fact that maybe uh, Lori's baby could be a walker or, or something to that effect, but it turns out that that wasn't the case. That wasn't the problem with her complications. And we see when um, Maggie has to perform a C-section on her. We see that she previously had a scar for a C-section. So it looks like she, you know, had problems in the past with delivering a baby vaginally. But in any event, like I said before, this was just, um, an incredibly moving scene. Maggie had to take a knife and cut her open and basically pulled the baby out of her dead body. And Lori, you know, she died in the process. And it it was just an incredibly heart-wrenching scene to see that, to see Maggie have to, to cut Lori open and to see Carl have to step up and be the man that Rick told him that at some point he would have to be and to see how he had to put his mother down basically I mean the way you would I don't know euthanize an animal or something so that was just incredibly heart-wrenching to see that and at the end we see that it in fact was Andrew who sabotaged everything and Rick was gets into a struggle with Andrew a pretty much a life or death struggle where he has to fight in order to, to kill Andrew and turn off the, the sirens um, at the prison, and I'm 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 pretty sure that this was I, I wouldn't call it a contrived plot device, but it was definitely a plot device to try and bring the other prisoners into the fold of the group, because one of the prisoners actually have to has to save Rick from Andrew. When Andrew is about to to kill Rick, he steps in and shoots and kills. Um, Andrew in order to save Rick's life. So at this point, it looks like that was a plot device to set up a justification for the other prisoners joining Rick's group. So at this point, um, Lori died in this episode. Carol died in this episode. And T-Dog died in this episode. So um, uh, a major series of events in this episode. And if we're only on episode four and all of this is happening, I can't imagine what the hell they have in store for the rest of the season. Because we've got 12 episodes to go. So, holy crap. Um, but, but so that was basically it for this, this week's episode. But I do have a question. I'm, I'm wondering precisely how the group will get to Woodbury. I know at some point... They're going to get to Woodbury, but I'm really curious to see how they're going to make it from the prison to Woodbury. But besides that, all in all, this was just an absolutely amazing episode. Like I said, the first four episodes of this season has just absolutely solidified The Walking Dead as one of the best shows currently on TV. Hands down, absolutely amazing episode. 
So this was your boy Uber Hikari, aka the Nerd Nigga. Just brought you another video with no frills, just the analysis. Peace and have a blessed day.